Welcome back to this lovely Sunday talk show here on the Arise News channel. Today, as I said earlier, I have with me Professor David Awurawo, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos. Yemi Adel Molekun, he's also back, Executive Director, Enough is Enough. Now, let's start with uh, a subject that uh, is very important to all of you, and particularly, you know, Yemi Adel Molekun. Yeah. Um, you know, before we begin to review the uh, submissions earlier on uh, by our guests on this program. Uh, Candidate of the People's Democratic Party in the 2023 presidential elections, Atiku Abubakar, has filed new documents against President Bola Tinubu before the Supreme Court, in which he accused the president of forgery and lying under oath and should therefore be disqualified and removed from office. Sources told this day on Saturday night that the evidence filed by Atiku was the academic record of Tinubu which was handed over to him by the Chicago State University last Monday, following the order of a court in the United States instructing the university to release the academic records as requested by Atiku. Atiku had requested the documents for use in the Supreme Court of Nigeria to support his argument that Tinubu forged a certificate he claimed to have obtained from the Chicago University in 1979 and submitted same to the Independent National Electoral Commission for the 2023 presidential election. In addition to filing an election petition appeal at the Supreme Court to challenge the judgment of the presidential election petition tribunal, which upheld Tinubu's victory, the PDP standard bearer had sought the academic record of the president from the Chicago State University to prove his allegation of forgery against the former Lagos state governor. Okay, we have this issue. In addition to the other issues that we have discussed, we had a guest, uh, Professor Ajayi from the Lagos Business School, who looked at uh, capital importation. The fact that 28 states of Nigeria have not received any importation of capital from anywhere in the world. And that only Lagos State and FCT and some states, the Kitty State getting $25,000, Undo State getting $200,000 in the first, second quarter, in the second quarter of uh, 2023. We talked about first subsidy. Now that the queues have returned, and there's a lot of talk by oil marketers and dealers saying that the NMPC enjoys a monopoly that they do not find comfortable. And that in any case, you know, this uh, uh, foreign exchange crisis and the monopoly of supply, you know, both remain a problem in that sector. And we had a teacher, provost of the uh, Federal College of Education, Oshie, uh, no, not Oshiele, Oshiele is in Abeta, Akoka, Yaba, in Lagos, yeah saying that, yes, teachers face a lot of challenges. This week was a week of uh, teachers, teachers worldwide. How important are they? Why do we have shortage of teachers? The only new thing that I've added to it is this issue about uh, former Vice President Atiku Abubaka now serving a notice of motion to the uh, Supreme Court of Nigeria on the issues about the qualification of the president. There are legal parts to it. There are moral parts to it. There are partisan parts uh, to that subject. But I don't know where people stand. So these are some of the subjects we've taken on today on this program. Yemi Adam Olakun, let me start with you. Particularly your special concern about uh, the qualification or non-qualification, the forgery or non-forgery of uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. I'm not quite sure why you're framing it as a special concern. You no, know, it's a special concern because you wanted the subject, well, especially. The, the point, it's not that I wanted it specially. It's the top news item in the country. So for the Africa's most populous nation, 
um, the largest democracy in Africa. We have this issue and we're not going to talk about it today. It was of concern to me. I understand quite clearly that the matter is subjudice, but I do think beyond the legal issues, the larger issues, not just about the two, and I like someone Kola Wale's, um, <laughs> Kola, Kola, Kola Wale's article today, the Sh Chicago bullfight, that beyond the legal issues, there are issues on reflection for us as Nigerians. Why something as simple, as, we're talking about this week being Teacher's Day, why something as simple as academic records as not only taking us from Nigeria to the United States and become such a whirlwind of, of discussion, information, headlines in international papers. And it's not, um, not just about the person on the table, but just this culture that it's okay. I mean, we've had several, a few reports really. I think it's universities at a point where if you're asked for uh, university staff to bring back to be re what that word is, re-accredited your credentials. And then there are questions raised about, did people really go to where they said they went to? Or members of the National Assembly or people in public office, that as a country, it's not just about one man. It's about the fact that these things, Oluwole has a name for a reason. Oluwole has a name because, <laughs> because people patronize that. And as a, as a, as a, as a people, that seems to be okay. And it's not, it's, not really, it's not really a big deal. But I think the more fundamental point I wanted to make is the context of the fact about the request and the request that was made or the issue that was made around privacy of access to records. An employer has the right to ask for an employee's records because it is on the basis of your records that you apply for a job or you apply for a position. As citizens of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the chief public servant is the office of the president. And I think it says something where a person occupying that position has a problem with his employees understanding his track record of what has brought him to where he is. And I think if we take out the legal issues, yes, it's come up in a legal context for political office. But if we take out that framing of the issue, there is something to be said of why someone who wants to occupy the highest office in, in the land has a problem with boldly saying, yeah, this is my track record. This is where I went. This is where I went. These are my classmates. Primary school, this is where I went. Whatever happened to my records, I've gone back to claim it because I went to school. This is where I went to secondary school. This is where I went to university. And I think we, we, we've gotten so caught up, I and mean, even in the way it's been framed, we've gotten caught up in the politics of it that we're losing the basic right, I believe, of citizens to be able to ask where anybody who's applying for a job, not least your chief public servant, went to school or what they did with their lives before they came, before they came to that role. Um, in terms of investment, I, I mean, look, the Naira has gone from, I don't even know, from May to now, the Naira has lost, I don't know what percentage in value, but have gone from 700 to 1,000 plus. So it's very hard for people who, for an investor who needs clarity about what is going to happen with my money to bring money. That's number one, from even the outside bit of it. From the internal bit of it, a lot of our states are not particularly focused on creating an environment where invest investment comes into the state because we're sharing money and we don't necessarily need to be productive. And in a sense, there's no penalty for being unproductive. States are, states are poor, residents are poor, and the services that will generate a productive environment, those who govern those states don't rely on those services Education, your kids go to school abroad. Healthcare, you fly abroad for a headache. Um, so when the ecosystem is not one that serves all of us equally, it should, it should not be a surprise. And the interesting thing about teachers is that it's, it's not new, that it's, it, it's been a gradual decline of how, in a sense, we see the teaching profession. So it's not something that people take pride in wanting to study. Like if people at the point in, like if you got into university for education, it seemed to be less than if you had gotten in for maybe law or medicine or whatever it is. And as teachers look for other ways to earn a living that allows them to, um, to be functional in society, it's not surprising at all that teaching will not be, will not be top, top of the list. Especially in a country where education is not something that we prioritize. Um, we're 200 million strong, we're entering uh, we're in a digital age. 
Education holds such an important part in the ability of this country to be competitive. But as a country, we don't have a strong policy that says this, and this is not just classroom teaching, just generally our value of education is, is quite poor. And we want yet to, to be competitive in this century. It's, it's not going to happen. But. Okay, Professor Awurawu, all, all of these subjects, as I've outlined them, are before us. Your take. Um, I would like to begin with the uh, comments on um, the teaching profession, Teacher's Day in the course of the week. As a teacher yourself. Yes, of course. I bet you, don't forget that President Tinubu offered you people, you know, in your case, 30 uh, percent with I'll, areas, backdated I'll, areas. I'll comment on that in a moment. I'm sorry, have you received the money? Receive, okay. <laughs> is that as you receive money? <laughs> yes, um, there is uh, an exodus of teachers, the way we have had nurses and doctors also exist in the country. I have one of my brightest students, he's not even in the teaching at the university level, at the secondary school level, he's now in Ghana. He taught briefly in uh, Malaysia, and then he's now in Ghana. Uh, a lot of them are also moving to the United Kingdom. Uh, we, we have what we have now because of the contradiction between the fact that the teaching profession needs the best. For you to be able to impart knowledge, you have to have knowledge. Um, that contradiction between uh, having the best, having to look for the best to teach, and the teachers themselves being among the least paid, you know, that contradiction, that's why uh, we have what we have. Um, in the, at the university level, there are some departments that, that, that uh, stand the risk of shutting down. Mm -hmm. I was in IFE a fortnight ago, I'll be back there this week. Um, there are some departments that are about to shut down because virtually all the um, professionals have gone abroad. So it is that bad. Um, there was a, a report in The Guardian a few days ago, uh, you know, with some graphs being plotted to establish the exodus of, you know, professionals including teachers in the past um, uh, couple of years, and of course intensifying in the, in the last few months. So it is real that teachers are moving away. And the reason is very simple. Uh, what teachers are paid is too small. Um, and if they have an opportunity to go somewhere else to earn a lot more, why not? And that takes me to the comments uh, regarding the recent 35%, 25% increase in salaries of teachers in tertiary level. Uh, the last time I commented on this, I made, I made it very clear that where 35%, 25% will thank the government for uh, the gesture, but also remind government that that is just the tip of the iceberg because the, the committee government set up to advise as to you know, what to do recommended 200%, the NIMI Breeze Committee, minimum 200%. And that 200% was arrived at with the African average. They took the average across Africa. So we needed to get 200% to get even half of the African average. That tells you how bad, you know, the thing is in Nigeria. I have younger friends who teach abroad. We were just left to the UK about two years ago. What he earns can pay almost 10 professors. I mean, he earns about four, if you can, if you, the but cost I mean, of mine about four million. Professor earns one, four and 14. That's about 10 professors. So he can easily, even though the cost of living there is higher and all that, mm. He can do with all that and still have 2,000 pounds or thereabouts left, about 2 million, over 2 million naira. So if he has that opportunity, why will he see it down here? So it's a matter of, you know, uh, the economics of the teaching profession. The government has done well by quickly doing this, but the government needs need to do a lot more to encourage the best to remain. But like I said, you need the best to make teaching effective. But when you have looking for the best, with the, probably the worst salary structure, that mismatch will produce the situation for the exodus we are seeing. Um, we hope that government will live up to, we are already seeing governments talking about the percentage of the budget to education will rise tremendously, uh, focus on uh, training and all that, fine. As for the standard of living, uh, standard of education that Dr. Aziz talked about, yes. Um, I don't agree with him that the standard has not gone down. It has gone down, but only my, not as much as the alarm people are raising. At the university level, it hasn't gone down much. I mean, our students who have trained, who have gone abroad, they compete very well everywhere they have gone. A couple of them are in Harvard as we speak. 
No, you know, land is a tough place. Uh, well, uh, you we will terrorize, do you do terrorize do, students. They do not you take attendance. Yeah. You don't allow. You, that is what you, you need to get to This is a university. Let me tell you something. It sounds <laughs> like a secondary school. Hey, Professor Kim they Kim treat their students like <laughs> secondary no, 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 school. No, no, no. <laughs> well, we have different styles. We have different ways of getting students to attend classes and be serious. Let me just tell you something. The professor came from Princeton. Sometimes, about this time last year, he came visited us. He was doing some research in Nigeria. One of our students who just graduated is his PhD student. He told me, well, he also came and looked at our curriculum. And he told me, look, if you can implement this, you're even ahead of us. Mm. And he told me about that lady. Her name is Susan. He came to my seat and whispered to my ears and said, don't tell her this is the best PhD student I've ever supervised. Mm. Mm. So Now the world knows. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, and it's not an isolation. Mm. But what we have had is that we also have a large number of students, mm. some of which are not supposed to be in the university. Yep. So when the chances that you come across those, mm. and you think that that is the standard mm. for the, there are people who cannot write applications. That is very correct. But you also have, you know, about 40% of them that are very, very good, that can match anybody across the world. So it's not true that the standard have gone down as it is being projected. Maybe more the primary school level, especially in government schools where, you know, people but, are not but qualified people, are, But people you know, say that based on their that. engagement, and I think you can't dismiss that. That what? Because, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm an employer of labor. So if someone comes into my office and can't, as you rightly said, can't write a short essay, can't speak articulately, I will say the standards have gone down because that's my experience. So yes. I think you can't disengage. So you might have good students, but I think you're, I, I would disagree that your percentage of just how many of them are that brilliant is a bit exaggerated. Not to say that they're not really good students, but the daily experience of Nigerians with university graduates in this country is not, it's not as you are painting it. Yeah, if point. you have 60% uh, not so good, 40% so good, the chances are that you come across ones that are not so good. True. Uh -huh. So true. what has happened is that we have had a large number coming to the university over the years who should not be in the university. And that creates that crisis. Uh, but, uh, professor, I wanted you to also talk about this capital importation. Why is it that Nigeria is not getting foreign direct investment? Why is it that 28 states of Nigeria, as pointed out, you know, by the National Bureau of Statistics, uh, have received zero foreign investment in the second quarter? 32, over 32 percent drop compared to uh, 2022 year on year. Is, uh, if this is the situation at Q2, 2023, why is everybody running away from this country? Well, maybe we just had elections well. Well, a, a friend of mine he always says that the dollar is shy to go to where it cannot replicate itself. <laughs> a way of saying that the economic environment mm. is a factor in how foreign investment is attracted. Mm. So what the government needs to look at is the environment, the policies. How friendly are they? How consistent are they? How encouraging are they for those who come to invest to be able to you know, make return? They are not charity. Those who invest don't do charity. Mm. They come to invest and make profit. And issues, I think, that needs to be looked at, this dollar thing, people have invested, can they get okay. their money? All of those things, I think, that government needs to take a very serious look at mm. so that the trend can be reversed. And of course, finally, on the uh, president's certificate issues, what I would just want to say is that the that's just the lessons from it. Mm. We need to be very careful. We need not to take anything for granted. When you are filling your forms, how do you don't just say write anything there? <laughs> you know things like that. I, no, I'm doing so. I told you I'll be back to Ife this week. I'm going to go, you know for a conference. I will speak on uh, two former uh, or niece, you know, uh, Shijua Day and. Uh, 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 one theme that is coming through is Omoluabi, Omoluabi, Omoluabi. Mm. When we don't take care about things like filling our forms, our certificates, and things like that, where, where we live, the, um, what kind of Omoluabi are we going to be described as? Mm. Are we, is Omoluabi going to be associated with us at all? Mm. So the lesson from all of this is to be careful to have very high standards. Take nothing for granted so you can have peace moving forward. Before okay. we go on, I think okay. the important point also that maybe it should be emphasized <clears throat> as we talk about the in <clears throat> excuse me. As we talk about the investment, it's just focusing on the period. It's Q2. And Q2 is what's Q2 now? April, May, June. 
Yeah, yeah. Second we, quarter. Second quarter, exactly. We had elections in February. Um, uncertainty swan in, in May. Elections contested. Uncertain country, uncertain business environment. So I think those are really strong factors for that. And we shouldn't take the analysis out of context of it being um, like a whole year or a whole period. It's Q2. So it would be interesting. I mean, I don't think Q3 will be much better because the uncertainty still continues. But maybe when the Supreme Court judgment then comes down in November, we'll then see what then happens with our economic policies and how um, foreign investors well, engage. The, the caveat to that is that whatever the National Bureau of Statistics comes up with, mm. you and I, all of us, we're living in a definite reality. Indeed. Whereby Indeed. inflation is, Indeed. Indeed. Uh, you know, off the roof, uh, top, and also, you know, people are having difficulties with regard to fuel supply daily and living. basic essential living. issues. Yeah. You know, so we don't even need the National Bureau of Statistics to tell us, tell us that something is wrong with this environment. But let's take an aspect of that. The Nigerian Labour Congress, NLC, has vowed to embark on indefinite nationwide strike without notice, if the federal government fails to meet its demands. The Nigeria Labor Congress and Trade Union Congress on Monday agreed to suspend for 30 days the planned indefinite nationwide strike scheduled to begin Tuesday, October 3, 2023. The decision followed the agreements reached between the organized labor and the federal government on the provision of palliatives by the government to ease the suffering of Nigerians that came with the withdrawal of subsidy on petroleum motor spirit by the federal government and the resultant increase in the price of the commodity. Labor had issued a strike notice, which elapsed, and they were poised to embark on a strike built to commence on Tuesday, October 3, 2023. And in addition to that also, we have other issues. Now, Organized labor is saying, when next it will go on strike, there will be no notice. Because according to them, the leaders, the demands have not been met. Now the federal government at the last meeting has set up what they call another co subcommittee yeah. to look at these issues within the next 30 days. Is there any guarantee? Is there any renewed hope? <laughs> that these issues will be addressed. These issues include the pump price of petrol, compressed natural gas being provided, areas of, uh, you know, uh, payments of persons being addressed. The only new thing that has been introduced is the plight of pensioners. And which is why I'm not too happy that Professor Akintene why is not here today. <laughs> Last week, he brought up the issue of pensioners, that pensioners should also be uh, included in this package. And uh, a few days later, Joe Ajero, Comrade Joe Ajero, president of the Nigerian Labor Congress said, look, pensioners should also be part of this matter, as we have in the UK, what they call the triple lock uh, system. I've commented on it elsewhere, saying, okay, yeah, it looks like there is uh, something important in that direction. But in any case, what Labour is saying is that if demands are not met, if these demands are not met, if the subcommittee does not come up, the same way previous committees left the negotiation table, that Nigeria will be plunged into another round of Labour crisis. Do we have any hope that organised Labour would make some headway this time. You hear me? Let me start with you again. You know, they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and expecting a different result. And this whole song and dance that labor and government do is, is what that is. So labor threatens to go on strike. Government calls a meeting. We sign an MOU, we give a little here, we give a little here. I'd better still, we make a promise here, make a promise there. Everybody goes back and then we wait for 30% of what are they giving you, yeah. And then we wait for whatever it is that government um, says it's going to do. And then government reneges and we start the dance all over again. 
So I really don't, I mean, which is why for a large majority of the populace, Labour really has lost any, I guess, the bite that it used to have, that people could rely on Labour to do what it's, in a sense, as a mandate, to stand up for the rights of the working class. So if you constantly go to the table negotiating with a government that has consistently, and now I'm not even talking about, I'm just talking, for example, APC, like let's even leave continuous gov administrations. Let's focus on the APC administration, which has been in power for eight years and now has continued. You've consistently gone to battle with this administration and every single time they make promises that they break. And we have not shifted, not only in the way we're negotiating, but in the way that we're engaging the fundamental issues. I was very clear leading up to the elections that, and I kept using ASU as an example, that if ASU doesn't make his autonomy a campaign issue, where they're clear, it's tied to the understanding of who is coming into office, that this is the way this sector can be sustainable, this song and dance will continue. It has continued. Unilag, unfortunately, even though quite a number of universities has increased their fees, Unilag, unfortunately, has been more has received a lot more fire by students. I guess maybe being in Lagos and Lagos being the center of protest around the increase in fees. But we need to have, and again, you have, we have not had a clear national conversation about the cost of tertiary education in this country. And so, and you do that, you, and this is part of the point you were making earlier. You've removed subsidy, electricity tariffs have gone up, you've increased fees, but on national TV, the Senate president is giving his colleagues two million naira because they're going on holiday for six weeks. You see the convoys of people in elected office. There's nothing that I have seen in this administration that has said anything about cost cutting. We now have 49 ministers. Have we hit 50 yet? You have a serving NYSC member as minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So you are doing all these things that continually say that we will do what we want to do, how we want to do it, with impunity, without a care for what's happening to Nigerians or how Nigerians are living and surviving, but you guys get to take the brunt of that. Then Labour will say they want to do strike because they're, start, they're um, advocating for the working class. There are no clear demands. Like, you know, there's some certain things that you even put on the table as a show of good faith that remove this, let's see that you are serious. But again, Labour's posture is always, what do we get? 30%, 25,000 Naira for this person, 25,000 Naira for that person. And none of the demand is something that will allow you that you're dealing with a government that's serious about taking care of the citizens they were elected to serve. So we've done this and they've now made this thing that they will go on strike without announcing. But we all know the way Labour works. Nobody can just wake up and say they're going on strike. You have to have meetings, have to have agreements. We will all know by the time they are going. So. Let's be watching. Professor Orao, what do you think? Yeah, um, I can understand the frustration of labor. Recall that, uh, uh, you know, uh, before the last uh, strike that they were, were to embark, embark on, which eventually didn't hold because government now negotiated and offered something here and there, uh, leaving the, you know, substance, the main, the main issues, and saying that they will address them and then they should give them time to do that. I can understand the frustration. You know, we discussed that in here that uh, organized labor was, you know, complaining. And, you know, other sectors of the economy, what the impact of the strike would be and all that. And since government seemed to offer something, you know, labor thought maybe uh, let us still give one more chance. If I were labor, I probably have done the same thing, uh, contrary to Yemi's position. Um, because everybody is careful not to further worsen the uh, uh, parlous economic condition. In addition to the fact that the president so, is supposed so is to my, be. Wait, wait, are you saying that I'm saying they shouldn't have? When you said. No, no, no that labor is not that. You know, labor is doing the same thing over and over again. Why is labor thinking that the results will be different? But what does labor put on the table that puts a demand on the government? What well, have they, put on the they, table? they are negotiating. That's and, my uh, point. So uh, put something on the table that government can do to even show good faith. But if not, you're negotiating on what you can get. Well, 30% well, uh, or 25%. Uh, that's the negotiation. Always on what do we get. No, that one is already secured. You know, have the you more, received it? The more, the, we've not, but that one is... <laughs> the more comprehensive, you know, things that government would do to cushion the effect, that's what they are negotiating. I'm saying this because, again, um, the president is supposed to be an activist of sorts. 
somebody who has been in the trenches and all that, mm. which is the aspect that is surprising to me, really. I never expected that there will be a ding-dong between Labour and the Tinubu government until all of these things are unfolding now. So let us hope that, because again, um, you know, the other day when uh, the board of NDDC was constituted, we protested in some two states. Mm. The president, you know, removed those ones and he came to the demand of the people. I mean, his party in this context. So if the government president can listen like that, we only expect that a more fundamental issue that has to do with the economy, the whole of labor going on strike, should be of even more interest to the president. So I still want to give a benefit of the doubt that government will avert an impending strike by ensuring that these negotiations will produce something concrete that would make Nigerians, you know, relieve Nigerians of the frustration and the suffering that the removal of oil subsidy and the attendant inflation, you know, has caused. Okay, let's take another subject. I'm Professor Awurawu on this one. I'm going to come to you. At least 37 persons, including two pregnant women, were burned to death after a blast at an illegal oil refinery in southern Nigeria. That's according to a local security official and community leader. The incident happened in the early hours of Monday in the Iba community in River State. Witnesses gave reports of charred remains of 15 persons at an open space surrounded by burnt palm trees and a motorbike. Relatives had identified some of the victims and taken them for burial. The Nigerian government has, for years, tried to clamp down on illegal crude refineries, but will lead to success. Partly because powerfully connected politicians and security officers are allegedly involved. Professor Awurawo, you are from the Niger Delta. Illegal refineries, crude oil theft. Why are we so blessed and yet so cursed? If you can have a play on Ayiko Amas' novel of a similar title. Well, um, three things. One of them is uh, insensitivity of government to the plight of the people. I mean, it has been like that over the years. People come to you know, establish, uh, uh, to drill oil, you know, uh, explore, explore and exploit oil resources, devastate the environment. People can carry out their legitimate economic activities anymore. They are affected that, you know, it's a bit poverty and all, and uh, many of them you know, uh, respond by doing these kind of things. That's one. The second is greed. Um, it's not just poverty that, you know, uh, causes this all the time. Uh, greed, too, is a part of it. Uh, some of those who establish this revenue are not poor. They just want to make mega money, uh, you know, off everybody, uh, as, as they say, uh, of our patrimony, so to speak. I mean, just like you said, there, there's oil in my place. Uh, OML 26 is my mother's land. <laughs> yes. Um, and that does not mean that we'll just go there and then try to say, mm -mm. They haven't treated the, us the, well. The, the OML, uh, whatever. 26. It, it passed through your backyard. Yeah, well, it's on my mother's land. <laughs> we found there before. <laughs> it's uh, not even backyard. Yes, it's, it's on my there. mother's land. Yes. So, so, Obeo. Obeo I land in, uh, in in Obeo. Obeo. so but <laughs> we don't go that direction because we know it's illegal. So it's not always uh, 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 poverty. Uh, people are poor, but they still manage to carry on without going to all this extreme. The third is security forces. Um, these things are not things that you can just put together, uh, you know, uh, that nobody can see. How this revenue are able to operate over a long time on things, these things like this happen before people now know that they are there. Of course, just tells you that you have complicity from security forces. Uh, to address all of this, the three issues have to be addressed. The communities that produce petroleum you know, resources deserve better attention. We've said that over and over and over for as long as you can remember. The security forces need to be more alert to their responsibility and not think that, oh, uh, that is their own, uh, to sh take their own share of the national cake. And my, our people too should be less greedy. Uh, they are endangering their life. The other day there was a, a truck that fell at, uh, um, you know, the boundary between uh, the Delta and uh, uh, Olobo, between Delta and uh, Edo State. People, and they went and started scooping fuel. Those, you know, on October 1st, on Independence Day, 
People will say, oh, government uh, is that did not do well. Uh, the people are poor. Ah. Coco, where people also were burnt, so, you know, hundreds were burnt a few years ago. It's not far from that place. Coco and GC. Yes, people, yes, people should know. So greed is a major, anybody that analyzes and does not talk about greed does not address the issue. And uh, we need to be less greedy. But to be able to overcome, you know, all of this. Okay, you mean very quickly before we take our last topic of the day. Why do we keep them as illegal refineries? The ones that are legal are not working. These ones are obviously <laughs> working. No, but it's true. The amount of billions that we've invested in turnaround maintenance, and I can't, I mean, I remember so distinctly Diazani uh, leading up to the Occupy Nigeria protest in 2012. Those refineries that were promised will be working within six months. This is 11 years later, not one of them are working. Yet we appropriate money for it. Yet we are surprised that people are dying for illegal oil refinery. To your first point, which is the only one I will agree with, this government is unserious. And until we begin to hold government accountable for these loss of lives, but people dying, unfortunately in Nigeria has become par for course. As a Nigerian, it can happen. And either you're scooping oil or you're walking down the road. And because we have a government that doesn't take the lives of its citizens seriously, this will continue to happen. Turn this thing into legal, legal business. And let's even have the oil to work with. Okay, as we begin to wrap up, let's go to the Middle East, where there's been a lot of uh, news in the last uh, 24, 48 hours. Israel's defense force is still trying to regain control of Israeli territory seized by Hamas militants in a shocking unprecedented raid from the Gaza Strip on Saturday. This, was, this has thrown the entire Middle East into turmoil. According to the Palestinians, Israeli airstrikes have killed over 300 people in the Gaza Strip, with almost 2,000 injured. In Israel, 300 civilians have also been killed, and dozens of Israelis have been taken hostage. Arise News Chief Correspondent John Cookson has been giving us blow-by-blow -blow accounts of events in that region. Here is his report, briefly. A long and difficult war is how Israel is describing the ongoing conflict as Israeli rockets still pound targets in the Gaza Strip. Gazans received Israeli text messages overnight telling them to leave their homes or take refuge somewhere. Cuts by the Israelis means power and fuel supplies are running low in the beleaguered enclave of around two million people. This Gaza resident says they're trying to pressure us to give up, but we tell them that we won't give up and we're here to stay. This is our land, he says, and we will not abandon our land. Hamas, the Iranian-backed militant group which controls Gaza, stunned the world and caught the Israelis completely off guard yesterday by breaking out of the Gaza Strip into Israeli territory. The dramatic incursion represented a stunning Israeli intelligence failure because the raid must surely have been long planned. Well, Hamas versus Israel. Professor Aurao, you teach international relations. What's next? What is the worst case scenario that the world should expect? The worst case scenario is, um, you know, prolonging, I mean, the dragging of the conflict, perpetuation of violence. That is the worst case scenario. And of course, more deaths. Um, we have had that over and over again in the, the conflict between Hamas and Israel. And of course, all the other groups too, uh, versus Israel. Um, what happened uh, yesterday is tragic. Um, they had conflicting reports, but uh, many reports indicate that uh, uh, over 200 Israelis have been killed. <laughs> One has to go far, far, far back, you know, to be able to remember any time that as many Israelis were killed in attack by any of these militants. So you're saying this is some form of humiliation? Yes. For Israel? Yes, it's unpre unprecedented. Hmm. Um, and of course, Israelis, the Israel government, Israeli government has, uh, you know, retaliated. And as the reports were also, you know, getting the case that close to 200 uh, Palestinians have been killed, many of them uh, Hamas uh, militants. 
Um, so there's escalation of violence. But like President uh, Biden said uh, yesterday, uh, Israel has the right to defend itself. But again, it should not overreact such that because in the past, if two or three Israelis are killed, 2,000 Palestinians mm. are killed in return. Mm. I mean, that is the kind of thing that uh, one would hope does not happen or, you know, in this particular one. But from the way things are going, it appears as if that is the direction we are going. But solution. Um, the two-state solution still remains the main solution. Mm. Uh, they both sides need to come to negotiate. Israel has to accept that two-state solution is the solution to a crisis in the Middle East. And Netanyahu is opposed to that. What has happened now is bad, but I'm happy it happened under Netanyahu. Mm. But if it happened under any other prime minister, I said, that, oh, if Netanyahu were there, nobody could have tried that. Mm. This has revealed that having power and being pro-war mm. does not prevent violence. Yeah. There will be a moment of relax, yeah. re relaxation, that would give the opponent opportunity to strike. So this indicates that exercise of power, brute force, is not the solution. Rather, diplomacy is the solution. The Palestinians, too, you know, in 1948, when Israel was, when the Israeli state was formed, they would have had their state. Instead of focusing on having their state, they were focused on stopping Israel yeah, from, from being established. Yeah. Now, Israel, 75 years on, Israel is coasting on. So these extremes are things that must be avoided. Israel must recognize that Palestinians have a right to live. They must be more tolerant. The other day we were watching when some Israeli soldiers were even harassing Christians and saying that they were idol worshippers, they should convert to, you know, Judaism. Most of the countries that support Israel are mostly Christian states. That is the kind of intolerance that must stop. You okay. don't want Muslims, you don't want Christians, who do you want? Yeah. So they must negotiate, I mean, robust negotiation that will lead to two-state solution. Okay. And tourism for Christians is yeah, part of the economy. Exactly. To wrap up. No, 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 I mean, really nothing to add. I was just going to add when he was talking about you don't want Christians, we don't want Muslims, but tourism for Christians forms a huge part of your economy. But, and I think maybe just the last point is also that for us as a country and a continent, with all that's happening in the world, nobody is coming to help us to solve our problems as a nation and as a continent. There's so much we could do within ourselves, but we're just not serious. And it's quite unfortunate, but, um, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Yemi Adam Alekun. Thank you also, Professor David Awurawo. You've been watching This Day Live, this Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now. And thank you very much for watching.